A year of globetrotting can't cure Jimmy's curious affliction. Will he ever get the remarkable girl from the steamer out of his head? P.G. Woodhouse, today on the Classic Tales podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We've had a few folks become supporters. Thank you so much to all of our new and returning supporters who chipped in this week. However, we still have a long way to go. Please go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a monthly supporter for as little as $5 a month. As a thank you gesture, we'll send you a coupon code every month for at least $8 off any audiobook order. If all goes well, hopefully we'll be back with more vintage episodes before you know it. Last week we met Jimmy, who had just returned to America from England and was smitten with a girl he met. Kind of. Their eyes met, but they never spoke. On returning to New York, Jimmy's flat was broken into by Spike Mullins, who Jimmy took a liking to. Spike and Jimmy then broke into the home of Mr. McEckern, the grafting chief of police, and the father to the enigmatic girl Jimmy saw on the steamer. And now, The Intrusion of Jimmy, Part 2 of 7, by P.G. Woodhouse. Chapter 8. At Drever In the days before he began to expend his surplus energy in playing rugby football, the Welshman was accustomed, whenever the monotony of his everyday life began to oppress him, to collect a few friends and make raids across the border into England, to the huge discomfiture of the dwellers on the other side. It was to cope with this habit that Drever Castle, in the county of Shropshire, came into existence. It met a long-felt want. In time of trouble, it became a haven of refuge. From all sides, people poured into it, emerging cautiously when the marauders had disappeared. In the whole history of the castle, there is but one instance recorded of a bandit attempting to take the place by storm, and the attack was an emphatic failure. On receipt of a ladle full of molten lead, aimed to a nicety by one John the Chaplain, evidently one of those sporting parsons. This warrior retired, done to a turn, to his mountain fastnesses, and was never heard of again. He would seem, however, to have passed the word around among his friends, for subsequent raiding parties studiously avoided the castle, and a peasant who had succeeded in crossing its threshold was for the future considered to be home and out of the game. Such was the Drever of old. In later days, the Welshman having calmed down considerably, it had lost its militant character. The old walls still stood, grey, menacing, and unchanged, but they were the only link with the past. The castle was now a very comfortable country house, nominally ruled over by Hildebrand Spencer Point de Burg John Hanaseed Cum Crombie, twelfth. Earl of Drever, Spenny, to his relatives and intimates, a light-haired young gentleman of twenty-four, but in reality the possession of his uncle and aunt, Sir Thomas and Lady Julia Blunt. Lord Drever's position was one of some embarrassment. At no point in their history had the Drevers been what one might call a parsimonious family. If a chance presented itself of losing money in a particularly wild and futile manner, the drever of the period had invariably sprung at it with the vim of an energetic bloodhound. The South Sea bubble absorbed two hundred thousand pounds of good drever money, and the remainder of the family fortune was squandered to the ultimate penny by the sportive gentleman who held the title in the days of the Regency, when Watiers and the cocoa tree were in their prime and fortunes had a habit of disappearing in a single evening. 
When Spenny became Earl of Drever, there was about one dollar and thirty cents in the family coffers. This is the point in which Sir Thomas Blunt breaks into Drever history. Sir Thomas was a small, pink, fussy, obstinate man with a genius for trade and the ambition of an Alexander the Great, probably one of the finest and most complete specimens of the came over Waterloo Bridge with half a crown in my pocket and now look at me class of millionaires in existence. He had started almost literally with nothing. By carefully excluding from his mind every thought except that of making money, he had risen in the world with a gruesome persistence which nothing could check. At the age of fifty-one, he was chairman of Blunt's Stores Limited, a member of Parliament, silent as a wax figure, but a great comfort to the party by virtue of liberal contributions to its funds, and a knight. This was good, but he aimed still higher, and meeting Spenny's aunt, Lady Julia Coombe Crombie, just at the moment when, financially, the Drevers were at their lowest ebb, he had effected a very satisfactory deal by marrying her, thereby becoming, as one might say, chairman of Drever Limited, until Spenny should marry money, an act on which his chairman vehemently insisted. Sir Thomas held the purse, and except in minor matters ordered by his wife, of whom he stood in uneasy awe, had things entirely his own way. One afternoon, a little over a year after the events recorded in the preceding chapter, Sir Thomas was in his private room, looking out of the window, from which the view was very beautiful. The castle stood on a hill, the lower portion of which, between the house and the lake, had been cut into broad terraces. The lake itself and its island, with the little boathouse in the center, gave a glimpse of fairyland. But it was not altogether the beauty of the view that had drawn Sir Thomas to the window. He was looking at it chiefly because the position enabled him to avoid his wife's eye, and just at the moment he was rather anxious to avoid his wife's eye. A somewhat stormy board meeting was in progress, and Lady Julia, who constituted the board of directors, had been heckling the chairman. The point under discussion was one of etiquette, and in matters of etiquette, Sir Thomas felt himself at a disadvantage. I tell you, my dear, he said to the window, I am not easy in my mind. Nonsense, snapped Lady Julia. Absurd, ridiculous. Lady Julia Blunt, while conversing, resembled a Maxim gun more than anything else. But your diamonds, my dear, we shall take care of them. But why should we have the trouble? Now, if we, it's no trouble. When we were married, there was a detective. Don't be childish, Thomas. Detectives at weddings are quite customary. But, da! Ah, I paid twenty thousand pounds for that rope of diamonds, said Sir Thomas, obstinately. Switched things upon a cash basis, and he was more at ease. May I ask if you suspect any of our guests of being criminals? inquired Lady Julia, with a glance of chill disdain. Sir Thomas looked out of the window. At the moment the sternest censor could have found nothing to cavil at in the movements of such of the house party as were in sight. Some were playing tennis, some clock golf, and others were smoking. Why, no, he admitted. Of course, absurd, quite absurd. But the servants, we have engaged a number of new servants lately, with excellent recommendations. Sir Thomas was on the point of suggesting that the recommendations might be forged, but his courage failed him. Julia was sometimes so abrupt in these little discussions, she did not enter into his point of view. He was always a trifle inclined to treat the castle as a branch of Blunt's stores. As proprietor of the stores, he had made a point of suspecting everybody, and the results had been excellent. In Blunt's stores, you could hardly move in any direction without bumping into a gentlemanly detective, efficiently disguised. For the life of him, Sir Thomas could not see why the same principle should not obtain at Drever. Guests at a country house do not, as a rule, steal their host's possessions, but then it is only an occasional customer at a store who goes in for shoplifting. It was the principle of the thing, he thought. Be prepared against every emergency. With Sir Thomas Blunt, Suspiciousness was almost a mania. 
he was forced to admit that the chances were against any of his guests exhibiting larcenous tendencies, but as for the servants, he thoroughly mistrusted them all, except Saunders, the butler. It had seemed to him the merest prudence that a detective from a private inquiry agency should be installed at the castle while the house was full. Somewhat rashly, he had mentioned this to his wife, and Lady Julia's critique of the scheme had been terse and unflattering. I suppose, said Lady Julia sarcastically, you will jump to the sort of conclusion that this man whom Spenny is bringing down with him today is a criminal of some sort. Ah, is Spenny bringing a friend? There was not a great deal of enthusiasm in Sir Thomas's voice. His nephew was not a young man whom he respected very highly. Spenny regarded his uncle with nervous apprehension, as one who would deal with his shortcomings with vigor and severity. Sir Thomas, for his part, looked on Spenny as a youth who would get into mischief unless under his uncle's eye. I had a telegram from him just now, Lady Julia explained. Who is his friend? He doesn't say. He just says he's a man he met in London. <laughs> and what does humph mean? demanded Lady Julia. A man can pick up strange people in London, said Sir Thomas judicially. Nonsense! Just as you say, my dear. Lady Julia rose. As for what you suggest about the detective, it is, of course, absolutely absurd. Quite so, my dear. You mustn't think of it. Just as you say, my dear. Lady Julia left the room. What followed may afford some slight clue to the secret of Sir Thomas Blunt's rise in the world. It certainly suggests singleness of purpose, which is one of the essentials of success. No sooner had the door closed behind Lady Julia than he went to his writing table, took pen and paper, and wrote the following letter. To the manager, Rags Detective Agency. Holborn Bars, London, E.C. Sir, with reference to my last of the 28th ultimatum, I should be glad if you would send down immediately one of your best men. I'm making arrangements to receive him. Kindly instruct him to present himself at Drever Castle as applicant for position of valet to myself. I will see and engage him on his arrival, and further instruct him in his duties. Yours faithfully, Thomas Blunt. P.S. I shall expect him tomorrow evening. There is a good train leaving Paddington at 2.15. Sir Thomas read this over, put in a comma, then placed it in an envelope, and lighted a cigar with the air of one who can be checked, yes, but vanquished, never. Chapter 9. Friends New and Old On the night of the day on which Sir Thomas Blunt wrote and dispatched his letter to Rag's detective agency, Jimmy Pitt chanced to stop at the Savoy. If you have the money and the clothes, and do not object to being turned out into the night, just as you are beginning to enjoy yourself, there are few things pleasanter than supper at the Savoy Hotel, London. But as Jimmy sat there, eyeing the multitude through the smoke of his cigarette, he felt, despite all the brightness and glitter, that this was a flat world, and that he was very much alone in it. A little over a year had passed since the merry evening at Police Captain McEachern's. During that time, he had covered a good deal of new ground. His restlessness had reasserted itself. Somebody had mentioned Morocco in his hearing, and a fortnight later he was in Fez. Of the principals in that night's drama, he had seen nothing more. It was only when, after walking home on air, rejoicing over the strange chance that had led to his finding and having speech with the Lady of the Lusitania, he had reached 59th Street, that he realized how he had also lost her. It suddenly came home to him that not only did he not know her address, but he was ignorant of her name. Spike had called the man with the revolver boss throughout, only that and nothing more. Except that he was a police captain, Jimmy knew as little about the man as he had before their meeting, and Spike, who held the key to the mystery, had vanished. His acquaintances of that night had passed out of his life like figures in a waking dream. As far as the big man with the pistol was concerned, this did not distress him. He had known that massive person only for about a quarter of an hour, but to his thinking that was ample. Spike he would have liked to meet again, but he bore the separation with much fortitude. 
there remained the girl of the ship, and she had haunted him with unfailing persistence during every one of the 384 days that had passed since their meeting. It was the thought of her that had made New York seem cramped. For weeks, Jimmy had patrolled the likely streets, the park, the Riverside Drive, in the hope of meeting her. He had gone to the theaters and restaurants, but with no success. Sometimes he had wandered through the Bowery, on the chance of meeting Spike. He had seen redheads in profusion, but never again that of his young disciple in the art of burglary. In the end, he had wearied of the other friends of the strollers, had gone out again on his wanderings. He was greatly missed, especially by that large section of his circle, which was in a perpetual state of wanting a little to see it through till Saturday. For years, Jimmy had been to these unfortunates a human bank on which they could draw at will. It offended them that one of those rare natures, which are always good for two dollars at any hour of the day, should be allowed to waste itself on places like Morocco and Spain, especially Morocco, where by all accounts there were brigands with almost a New York sense of touch. They argued earnestly with Jimmy. They spoke of Raizuli and Kaid McLean. But Jimmy was not to be stopped. The gadfly was vexing him, and he had to move. For a year he had wandered, realizing every day the truth of Horace's philosophy for those who travel that a man cannot change his feelings with his climate, until finally he had found himself, as every wanderer does, at Charing Cross. At this point he had tried to rally. Such running away, he told himself, was futile. He would stand still and fight the fever in him. He had been fighting it now for a matter of two weeks, and already he was contemplating retreat. A man at luncheon had been talking about Japan, Watching the crowd, Jimmy had found his attention attracted chiefly by a party of three, a few tables away. The party consisted of a girl, rather pretty, a lady of middle age and stately demeanor, plainly her mother, and a light-haired, weedy young man in the twenties. It had been the almost incessant prattle of this youth, and the peculiarly high-pitched, gurgling laugh which had shot from him at short intervals that had drawn Jimmy's notice upon them and it was the curious cessation of both prattle and laugh that now made him look again in their direction. The young man faced Jimmy, and Jimmy, looking at him, could see that all was not well with him. He was pale. He talked at random. A slight perspiration was noticeable on his forehead. Jimmy caught his eye. There was a hunted look in it. Given the time and the place, there were only two things that could have caused this look. Either the light-haired young man had seen a ghost, or he had suddenly realized that he had not enough money to pay the check. Jimmy's heart went out to the sufferer. He took a card from his case, scribbled the words, Can I help? on it, and gave it to a waiter to take to the young man, who was now in a state bordering on collapse. The next moment the light-haired one was at his table, talking in a feverish whisper. I say, he said, it's frightfully good of you, old chap. It's frightfully awkward. I've come out with too little money. I hardly like to... You've never seen me before. Don't rub in my misfortunes, pleaded Jimmy. It wasn't my fault. He placed a five-pound note on the table. Say when, he said, producing another. I say, thanks fearfully, the young man said. I don't know what I'd have done. He grabbed at the note. I'll let you have it back tomorrow. Here's my card. Is your address on your card? I can't remember. Oh, by Jove! I've got it in my hand all the time. The gurgling laugh came into action again, freshened and strengthened by its rest. Savoy Mansions, eh? I'll come round tomorrow. Thanks frightfully again, old chap. I don't know what I should have done. It's been a treat, said Jimmy, deprecatingly. The young man flitted back to his table, bearing the spoil. Jimmy looked at the card he had left. Lord Drever, it read and in the corner the name of a well-known club. The name Drever was familiar to Jimmy. Everyone knew of Drever Castle, partly because it was one of the oldest houses in England, but principally because for centuries it had been advertised by a particularly gruesome ghost story. Everyone had heard of the secret of Drever, which was known only to the Earl and the family lawyer, and confided to the heir at midnight on his twenty-first birthday. Jimmy had come across the story in corners of the papers all over the states, from New York to One Horseville, Iowa. He looked with interest at the light-haired young man, the latest depository of the awful secret. 
It is popularly supposed that the heir, after hearing it, never smiled again. But it did not seem to have affected the present Lord Drever to any great extent. His gurgling laugh was drowning the orchestra. Probably, Jimmy thought, when the family lawyer had told the light-haired young man the secret, the latter's comment had been, No, really? By Jove, I say, you know! Jimmy paid his bill and got up to go. It was a perfect summer night, too perfect for bed. Jimmy strolled on the embankment and stood leaning over the balustrade, looking across the river at the vague, mysterious mass of buildings on the Surrey side. He must have been standing there for some time, his thoughts far away, when a voice spoke at his elbow. I say, excuse me, have you... Hello? It was his light-haired lordship of Drever. I say, by Jove, why, we're always meeting. <laughs> the tramp on the bench close by stirred uneasily in his sleep as the gurgling laugh rippled the air. Been looking at the water? inquired Lord Drever. I have. I often do. Don't you think it sort of makes a chap feel, oh, you know, sort of? I don't know how to put it. Mushy, said Jimmy. I was going to say poetical. Suppose there's a girl. He paused and looked down at the water. Jimmy was sympathetic with this mood of contemplation, for in his case, too, there was a girl. I saw my party off in a taxi, continued Lord Drever, and came down here for a smoke, only I hadn't a match. Have you? Jimmy handed over his matchbox. Lord Drever lighted a cigar, fixed his gaze once more on the river. Ripping it looks, he said. Jimmy nodded. Funny thing, said Lord Drever. In the daytime, the water here looks all muddy and beastly. Damn depressing, I call it. But at night, he paused. I say, he went on after a moment. Did you see the girl I was with at the Savoy? Yes, said Jimmy. She's a ripper, said Lord Drever devoutly. On the Thames embankment, in the small hours of a summer morning, there is no such thing as a stranger. The man you talk with is a friend, and if he will listen, as by the etiquette of the place he must, you may pour out your heart to him without restraint. It is expected of you. I'm fearfully in love with her, said his lordship. She looks a charming girl, said Jimmy. They examined the water in silence. From somewhere out in the night came the sound of oars as the police boat moved on its patrol. Does she make you want to go to Japan? asked Jimmy suddenly. Eh? said Lord Drever, startled. Japan? Jimmy adroitly abandoned the position of confidant and seized that of confider. I met a girl a year ago. Only met her once. But even then... Oh, well. Anyway, it's made me so restless that I haven't been able to stay in one place for more than a month on end. I tried Morocco, and I had to quit. I tried Spain, and that wasn't any good either. The other day I heard a fellow say that Japan was a pretty interesting sort of country. I was wondering whether I wouldn't give it a trial. Lord Drever regarded this travelled man with interest. It beats me, he said wonderingly. What you want to leg it about the world like that for? What's the trouble? Why don't you stay where the girl is? I don't know where she is. Don't know? She's disappeared. Where did you see her last? asked his lordship as if Molly were a mislaid penknife. New York? But how do you mean disappeared? Don't you know her address? I don't even know her name. But dash it all, I say. I mean, have you ever spoken to her? Only once. It's a rather complicated story. At any rate, she's gone. Lord Drever said that it was a rum business. Jimmy conceded the point. Seems to me, said his lordship, we're both in the cart. What's your trouble? Lord Drever hesitated. Oh, well, it's only that I want to marry one girl and my uncle's dead set on my marrying another. You afraid of hurting your uncle's feelings? It's not so much hurting his feelings. It's, oh, well, it's too long to tell now. I think I'll be getting home. I'm staying at our place in Eaton Square. How are you going? If you'll walk, I'll come some of the way with you. Right you are. Let's be pushing along, shall we? They turned up into the Strand, and through Trafalgar Square into Piccadilly. Piccadilly had a restful aspect in the small hours. Some men were cleaning the road with water from a long hose. The swishing of the torrent on the parched wood was musical. Just beyond the gate of Hyde Park, 
to the right of the road, stands a cabman's shelter. Conversation and emotion had made Lord Drever thirsty. He suggested coffee as a suitable conclusion to the night's revels. I often go in here when I'm up in town, he said. The cabbies don't mind. They're sportsmen. The shelter was nearly full when they opened the door. It was very warm inside. A cabman gets so much fresh air in the exercise of his professional duties that he is apt to avoid it in private life. The air was heavy with conflicting scents. Fried onions seemed to be having the best of the struggle for the moment, though plugged tobacco competed gallantly. A keenly analytical nose might also have detected the presence of steak and coffee. A dispute seemed to be in progress as they entered. You don't wish you was in Russia, said a voice. Yes, I do wish I was in Russia, retorted a shrivel mummy of a cabman, who was blowing patiently at a saucer full of coffee. Why did you wish you was in Russia? asked the interlocutor, introducing a mass of bones and mass of Johnson touch into the dialogue. Because you can wade over your knees in blood there, said the mummy. In what? In blood, ruddy blood. That's why I wish I was in Russia. Cheery cove, that, said Lord Drever. I say, can you give us some coffee? I might try Russia instead of Japan, said Jimmy meditatively. The lethal liquid was brought. Conversation began again. Other experts gave their views on the internal affairs of Russia. Jimmy would have enjoyed it more if he had been less sleepy. His back was wedged comfortably against the wall of the shelter, and the heat of the room stole into his brain. The voices of the disputants grew fainter and fainter. He had almost dozed off when a new voice cut through the murmur and woke him. It was a voice he knew, and the accent was a familiar accent. Gents, excuse me. He looked up. The mists of sleep shredded away. A ragged youth with a crop of fiery red hair was standing in the doorway, regarding the occupants of the shelter with a grin, half whimsical, half defiant. Jimmy recognized him. It was Spike Mullins. Excuse me, said Spike Mullins. Is there any gent in this bunch of professional buttes wants to give a poor orphan that suffers from a painful taste something to drink? Gents is courteously requested not to speak all in a crowd. Shut that blanky door, said the mummy cabman, sourly. And up it, added his late opponent. We don't want none of your sort here. Then you ain't my long-lost brothers after all, said the newcomer, regretfully. I thought yous didn't look handsome enough for that. Good night to yous, gents. Shut that door, can't you, what I'm telling you, said the mummy, with increased asperity. Spike was reluctantly withdrawing when Jimmy rose. One moment, he said. Never in his life had Jimmy failed to stand by a friend in need. Spike was not perhaps exactly a friend, but even an acquaintance could rely on Jimmy when down in the world, and Spike was manifestly in that condition. A look of surprise came into the Bowery boy's face, followed by one of stolid woodenness. He took the sovereign that Jimmy held out to him with a muttered word of thanks and shuffled out of the room. Can't say what you wanted to give him anything for, said Lord Drever. Chapel only spent it getting soused. Oh, he reminded me of a man I used to know. Did he? The bottoms, what is it, I should think, said his lordship. Shall we be moving? Chapter 10 Jimmy Adopts a Lame Dog A black figure detached itself from the blacker shadows and shuffled stealthily to where Jimmy stood on the doorstep. That you, Spike? asked Jimmy. That's right, boss. Come on in. He led the way up to his rooms switched on the electric light, and shut the door. Spike stood blinking at the sudden glare. He twisted his battered hat in his hands. His red hair shone fiercely. Jimmy inspected him out of the corner of his eye and came to the conclusion that the Mullins' finances must be at a low ebb. Spike's costume differed in several important details from that of the ordinary well-groomed man about town. There was nothing of the flaneur about the Bowery boy, his hat was of the soft black felt fashionable on the east side of New York. It was in poor condition, and looked as if it had been up too late the night before. A black tailcoat, burst at the elbows and stained with mud, 
was tightly buttoned across his chest, this evidently with the idea of concealing the fact that he wore no shirt, an attempt which was not wholly successful. A pair of grey flannel trousers and boots out of which two toes peeped coyly completed the picture. Even Spike himself seemed to be aware that there were points in his appearance which would have distressed the editor of a men's fashion paper. Excuse these duds, he said. My man's been and mislaid the trunk with my best suit in. This is me number two. Don't mention it, Spike, said Jimmy. You look a perfect matinee idol. Have a drink? Spike's eyes gleamed as he reached for the decanter. He took a seat. Cigar, Spike? Sure, thanks, boss. Jimmy lighted his pipe. Spike, after a few genteel sips, threw off his restraint and finished the rest of his glass at a gulp. Try another, suggested Jimmy. Spike's grin showed that the idea had been well received. Jimmy sat and smoked in silence for a while. He was thinking the thing over. He felt like a detective who has found a clue. At last, he would be able to discover the name of the Lusitania girl. The discovery would not take him very far, certainly, but it would be something. Possibly, Spike might even be able to fix the position of the house they had broken into that night. Spike was looking at Jimmy over his glass in silent admiration. The flat which Jimmy had rented for a year, in the hope that the possession of a fixed abode might help to tie him down to one spot, was handsomely, even luxuriously, furnished. To Spike, Every chair and table in the room had a romance of its own, as having been purchased out of the proceeds of that new Asiatic bank robbery, or from the revenue accruing from the Duchess of Havant's jewels. He was dumb with reverence for one who could make burglary pay to this extent. In his own case, the profession had rarely provided anything more than bread and butter, and an occasional trip to Coney Island. Jimmy caught his eye and spoke. Well, Spike, he said, Curious that we should meet like this. The limit, agreed Spike. I can't imagine you three thousand miles from New York. How do you know the cars still run both ways on Broadway? A wistful look came into Spike's eyes. I've been this side three months. I thought it was time to give old London a call. Things was getting too fierce in New York. The cops was laying for me. They didn't seem like as if they had any use for me. So I beat it. Bad luck said Jimmy. Fierce, agreed Spike. Say, Spike, said Jimmy, do you know I spent a whole heap of time before I left New York looking for you? Gee, I wish you'd found me. Did you want me to help on some lay, boss? Is it a bank or jewels? Well, no, not that. Do you remember that night we broke into that house uptown, the police captain's house? Sure. What was his name? What, the cops? Why, McEachern, boss. McWhat? How do you spell it? Search me, said Spike simply. Say it again. Fill your lungs and enunciate slowly and clearly. Be bell-like. Now. Mick Eckern. Ah, and where was the house? Can you remember that? Spike's forehead wrinkled. It's gone, he said at last. It was somewhere up some street up to town. That's a lot of help, said Jimmy. Try again. It'll come back sometime, boss, sure. Then I'm going to keep an eye on you till it does. Just for the moment, you're the most important man in the world to me. Where are you living? Me? Why, in the park. That's right. One of them swell detached benches with a sudden exposure. Well, unless you prefer it, you needn't sleep in the park any more. You can pitch your moving tent with me. What? Here, boss? Unless we move. Me for this, said Spike rolling luxuriously in his chair. You'll want some clothes, said Jimmy. We'll get those tomorrow. You're the sort of figure that can fit off the peg. You're not too tall, which is a good thing. Bad thing for me, boss. If I'd been taller, I'd have stood for being a cop and been buying a brownstone house on Fifth Avenue by this. It's the cops makes the big money in little old Manhattan. That's who it is. The man who knows, said Jimmy. Tell me more, Spike. I suppose a good many of the New York force do get rich by graft. Sure. Look at old man McEachern. I wish I could. Tell me about him, Spike. You seemed to know him pretty well. Me? Sure. There wasn't a worse old grafter than him and the bunch. He was out for the dough all the time. 
But say, did you ever see his girl? What's that? said Jimmy sharply. I see no once. Spike became almost lyrical in his enthusiasm. She, she was a boyd, a peach for fair. I'd have left me happy home for her. Molly was her moniker. She, Jimmy was glaring at him. Cut it out, he cried. Was that, boss? said Spike. Cut it out, said Jimmy savagely. Spike looked at him, amazed. Sure, he said, puzzled, but realizing that his words had not pleased the great man. Jimmy chewed the stem of his pipe irritably, while Spike, full of excellent intentions, sat on the edge of his chair, drawing sorrowfully at his cigar, and wondering what he had done to give offense. Boss, said Spike. Well? Boss, what's doing here? Put me next to the game. Is it the old lay? Banks and jewels from duchesses? You'll be able to let me sit in at the game, won't you? Jimmy laughed. I'd quite forgotten I hadn't told you about myself, Spike. I've retired. The horrid truth sank slowly into the other's mind. Say, what's that, boss? You cutting it out? That's it. Absolutely. Ain't you swiping no more jewels? Not me. No using the what's-its-name blowpipe? I've sold my oxyacetylene blowpipe, given away my anesthetics, and am going to turn over a new leaf and settle down as a respectable citizen. Spike gasped. His world had fallen about his ears. His excursion with Jimmy, the master cracksman in New York, had been the highest and proudest memory of his life, and now that they had met again in London, he had looked forward to a long and prosperous partnership in crime. He was content that his own share in the partnership should be humble. It was enough for him to be connected, however humbly, with such a master. He had looked upon the richness of London, and he had said with Blucher, What a city to loot! And here was his idol shattering the visions with the word. Have another drink, Spike, said the lost leader sympathetically. It's a shock to you, I guess. I taught, boss. I know. I know. These are life's tragedies. I'm very sorry for you, but it can't be helped. I've made my pile, so why continue? Spike sat silent, with a long face. Jimmy slapped him on the shoulder. Cheer up, he said. How do you know that living honestly may not be splendid fun? Numbers of people do it, you know, and enjoy themselves tremendously. You must give it a trial, Spike. Me, boss? Well, me too? Sure. You're my link with... I don't want to have you remembering that address in the second month out of a ten-year stretch at Dartmoor Prison. I'm going to look after you, Spike, my son, like a lynx. We'll go out together and see life. Brace up, Spike. Be cheerful. Grin. After a moment's reflection, the other grinned, albeit faintly. That's right, said Jimmy. We'll go into society, Spike, hand in hand. You'll be a terrific success in society— all you have to do is to look cheerful, brush your hair, and keep your hands off the spoons. For in the best circles, they invariably count them after the departure of the last guest. Sure, said Spike, as one who thoroughly understood this sensible precaution. And now, said Jimmy, we'll be turning in. Can you manage sleeping on the sofa one night? Some fellows would give their bed up to you. Not me, however. I'll have a bed made up for you tomorrow. Me? said Spike. Gee, I've been sleeping in the park all the last week. This is to the good, boss. Chapter 11 At the Turn of the Road Next morning, when Jimmy, having sent Spike off to the tailors, with instructions to get a haircut en route, was dealing with a combination of breakfast and luncheon at his flat, Lord Drever called. Thought I should find you in? observed his lordship. Well, laddie, how goes it? Having breakfast? Eggs and bacon. Great Scott, I couldn't touch a thing. The statement was borne out by his looks. The son of a hundred earls was pale, and his eyes were markedly fish-like. A fellow I've got stopping with me, taking him down to Drever with me today. A man I met at the club, a fellow named Hargate. Don't know if you know him? No? Well, he was still up when I got back last night, and we stayed up playing billiards. He's rotten at billiards, something frightful. I gave him twenty, till five this morning. 
I feel fearfully cheap. Wouldn't have got up at all, only I'm due to catch the 2.15 down to Drever. It's the only good train. He's dropped into a chair. Sorry you don't feel up to breakfast, said Jimmy, helping himself to marmalade. I am generally to be found among those lining up when the gong goes. I've breakfasted on a glass of water and a bag of birdseed in my time. That sort of thing makes you ready to take whatever you can get. Seen the paper? Thanks. Jimmy finished his breakfast and lighted a pipe. Lord Drever laid down the paper. I say, he said, what I came round about was this. What have you got on just now? Jimmy had imagined that his friend had dropped in to return the five-pound note he had borrowed, but his lordship maintained a complete reserve on the subject. Jimmy was to discover later that this weakness of memory where financial obligations were concerned was a leading trait in Lord Drever's character. Today, do you mean? said Jimmy. Well, in the near future. What I mean is, why not put off that Japan trip you spoke about and come down to Drever with me? Jimmy reflected. After all, Japan or Drever, it made very little difference, and it would be interesting to see a place about which he had read so much. That's very good of you, he said. You're sure it will be all right? It won't be upsetting your arrangements? Not a bit. The more the merrier. Can you catch the 2.15? It's fearfully short notice. Heavens yes, I can pack in ten minutes. Thanks very much. Good business. There'll be shooting and all that sort of rot. Oh, and by the way, are you any good at acting? I mean, there are going to be private theatricals of sorts. A man called Charteris insisted on getting them up. Always getting up theatricals. Rot, I call it, but you can't stop him. Do you do anything in that line? Put me down for what you like. From Emperor of Morocco to Confused Noise Without. I was on the stage once. I'm particularly good at shifting scenery. Good for you. Well, so long. 2.15 from Paddington, remember. I'll meet you there. I've got to go and see a fellow now. I'll look out for you. A sudden thought occurred to Jimmy. Spike. He had forgotten Spike for the moment. It was vital that the Bowery boy should not be lost sight of again. He was the one link with that little house somewhere beyond 150th Street. He could not leave the Bowery boy at the flat. A vision rose in his mind of Spike alone in London, with Savoy mansions as a base for his operations. No, Spike must be transplanted to the country. But Jimmy could not seem to see Spike in the country. His boredom would probably be pathetic. But it was the only way. Lord Drever facilitated matters. By the way, Pitt, he said, you've got a man of sorts, of course. One of those frightful fellows who forgot to pack your collars. Bring him along, of course. Thanks, said Jimmy. I will. The matter had scarcely been settled when the door opened and revealed the subject of discussion. Wearing a broad grin of mingled pride and bashfulness, and looking very stiff and awkward in one of the brightest tweed suits ever seen off the stage, Spike stood for a moment in the doorway to let his appearance sink into the spectator, then advanced into the room. How did these strike you, boss? he inquired genially, as Lord Drever gaped in astonishment at this bright being. Pretty nearly blind, Spike, said Jimmy. What made you get those? We use electric light here. Spike was full of news. Say, boss, that clothing store's a willy wonder, sure. The old mug which showed me around gave me the frozen face when I come in first. What's doing, he says. To the woods with you. Get the hook. But I hauls out the plunks you gave me and tells him how I'm here to get a dude suit, and gee, if he don't haul out suits by the mile. Give me a toast it did, watching him. It's up to you, says the mug. Choose something. You pays the money, and we does the rest. So I says, this is the one, and I puts down the plunks, and here I am, boss. I noticed that, Spike, said Jimmy. I could see you in the dark. Don't you like the duds, boss? inquired Spike anxiously. They're great, said Jimmy. You'd make Solomon in all his glory look like a tramp cyclist. That's right, agreed Spike. They's the limit. And apparently oblivious to the presence of Lord Drever, who had been watching him in blank silence since his entrance, the Bowery boy proceeded to execute a mysterious shuffling dance on the carpet. This was too much for the overwrought brain of his lordship. Goodbye, Pitt, he said. I'm off. Got to see a man. Jimmy saw his guest to the door. Outside, Lord Drever placed the palm of his right hand on his forehead. I say, Pitt, 
he said. Hello? Who the devil's that? Who, Spike? Oh, that's my man. Your man? Is he always like that? I mean, going on like a frightful music hall comedian? Dancing, you know? And say, what on earth language was that he was talking? I couldn't understand one word in ten. Oh, that's American. The Bowery variety. Oh, well, I suppose it's all right if you understand it. I can't. My God! He broke off with a chuckle. I'd give something to see him talking to old Saunders, our butler at home. He's got the manners of a duke. Spike should revise those, said Jimmy. What do you call him? Spike. Rummy name, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Short for Algernon. He seems pretty chummy. That's his independent bringing up. We're all like that in America. Well, so long. So long. On the bottom step, Lord Drever halted. I say, I've got it. Good for you. Got what? Why, I knew I'd seen that chap's face somewhere before, only I couldn't place him. I've got him now. He's the Johnny who came into the shelter last night. Chap you gave a quid to. Spikes was one of those faces that, without being essentially beautiful, stamped themselves on the memory. You're quite right, said Jimmy. I was wondering if you'd recognize him. The fact is, he's a man I once employed over in New York, and when I came across him over here, he was so evidently wanting a bit of help that I took him on again. As a matter of fact, I needed somebody to look after my things, and Spike can do it as well as anybody else. I see. Not bad my spotting him, was it? Well, I must be off. Goodbye. Two fifteen at Paddington. Meet you there. Take a ticket for Drever if you're there before me. Eight. Goodbye. Jimmy returned to the dining room. Spike, who was examining as much as he could of himself in the glass, turned round with his wanted grin. Say, who's the gazebo, boss? Ain't he the mug you was with last night? That's the man. We're going down with him to the country today, Spike, so be ready. On your way, boss. What's that? He has invited us to his country house, and we're going. What, both of us? Yes. I told him you were my servant. I hope you aren't offended. Nit. What's there to be raw about, boss? That's all right. Well, we'd better be packing. We have to be at the station at two. Sure. And Spike? Yes, boss? Did you get any other clothes besides what you've got on? Nit. What do I want with more than one dude suit? I approve of your rugged simplicity, said Jimmy. But what you're wearing is a town suit. Excellent for the park or the Marchioness's Thursday crush, but essentially metropolitan. You must get something else for the country, something dark and quiet. I'll come and help you choose it now. Why, won't this go into country? Not on your life, Spike. It would unsettle the rustic mind. They're fearfully particular about that sort of thing in England. Days to the bad, said the baffled discipline of Beau Brummel with deep discontent. And there's just one more thing, Spike. I know you'll excuse my mentioning it. When we're at Drever Castle, you will find yourself within reach of a good deal of silver and other things. Would it be too much to ask you to forget your professional instincts? I mentioned this before in a general sort of way, but this is a particular case. Ain't I to get busy at all, then? queried Spike. Not so much as a salt spoon, said Jimmy, firmly. Now we'll whistle a cab and go and choose you some more clothes. Accompanied by Spike, who came within an ace of looking almost respectable, in new blue serge, small gents off the peg, Jimmy arrived at Paddington Station with a quarter of an hour to spare. Lord Drever appeared ten minutes later, accompanied by a man of about Jimmy's age. He was tall and thin, with cold eyes and tight, thin lips. His clothes fitted him in the way clothes do fit one man in a thousand. They were the best part of him. His general appearance gave one the idea that his meals did him little good, and his meditations rather less. He had practically no conversation. This was Lord Drever's friend, Hargett. Lord Drever made the introductions, but even as they shook hands, Jimmy had an impression that he had seen the man before. Yet where or in what circumstances he could not remember. Hargate appeared to have no recollection of him, so he did not mention the matter. A man who has led a wandering life often sees faces that come back to him later on, absolutely detached from their context. He might merely have passed Lord Drever's friend on the street. But Jimmy had an idea that the other had figured in some episode which at the moment had had an importance. What that episode was had escaped him. He dismissed the thing from his mind. It was not worth harrying his memory about. 
Judicious tipping secured the three a compartment to themselves. Hargate, having read the evening paper, went to sleep in the far corner. Jimmy and Lord Drever, who sat opposite each other, fell into a desultory conversation. After a while, Lord Drever's remarks took a somewhat intimate turn. Jimmy was one of those men whose manner invites confidences. His lordship began to unburden his soul of certain facts relating to the family. Have you ever met my Uncle Thomas? he inquired. You know Blunt's stores? Well, he's Blunt. It's a company now, but he still runs it. He married my aunt. You'll meet him at Driva. Jimmy said he would be delighted. I bet you won't, said the last of the Drevers with candor. He's a frightful man, the limit. Always fussing round like a hen. Gives me a fearful time, I can tell you. Look here, I don't mind telling you we're pals. He's dead set on my marrying a rich girl. That sounds all right. There are worse hobbies. Any particular rich girl? There's always one. He sticks me on to one after another. Quite nice girls, you know, some of them. Only, I want to marry somebody else. That girl you saw me with at the Savoy. Why don't you tell your uncle? He'll have a fit. She hasn't a penny. Nor have I, except what I get from him. Of course, this is strictly between ourselves. Of course. I know everybody thinks there's money attached to the title, but there isn't. Not a penny. When my Aunt Julia married Sir Thomas, the whole frightful show was pretty well in pawn. So you see how it is. Ever think of work? asked Jimmy. Work? said Lord Drever, reflectively. Oh, you know, I shouldn't mind work, only I'm dashed if I can see what I could do. I shouldn't know how. Nowadays you want a fearful specialised education and so on. Tell you what, though, I shouldn't mind the diplomatic service. One of these days I shall have a dash at asking my uncle to put up the money. I believe I shouldn't be half bad at that. I'm rather a quick sort of chap at times, you know. Lots of fellows have said so. He cleared his throat modestly and proceeded. It isn't only my Uncle Thomas, he said. This Aunt Julia, too. She's about as much the limit as he is. I remember, when I was a kid, she was always sitting on me. She does still. Wait till you see her. Sort of woman who makes you feel that your hands are the colour of tomatoes and the size of legs of mutton, if you know what I mean, and talks as if she were biting at you. Frightful. Having unburdened himself of these criticisms, Lord Drever yawned, leaned back, and was presently asleep. It was about an hour later that the train which had been taking itself less seriously for some time, stopping at stations of quite minor importance and generally showing a tendency to dawdle, halted again. A board with the legend Drever in large letters showed that they had reached their destination. The stationmaster informed Lord Drever that her ladyship had come to meet the train in the motor car and was now waiting in the road outside. Lord Drever's jaw fell. Oh, Lord, he said, She's probably motored in to get the afternoon letters. That means she's coming in the runabout, and there's only room for two of us in that. I forgot to telegraph that you were coming, Pitt. I only wired about Hargate. Dash it, I shall have to walk. His fears proved correct. The car at the station door was small. It was obviously designed to seat four only. Lord Drever introduced Hargate and Jimmy to the statuesque lady in the tonneau, and then there was an awkward silence. At this point, Spike came up chuckling amiably with a magazine in his hand. Gee, said Spike, say, boss, the mug what wrote this piece must have been living out in the woods. Say, there's a gazebo what wants to swipe the heroine's jewels what's locked in a drawer. So this mug, what do you think he does? Spike laughed shortly in professional scorn. Why, is this gentleman a friend of yours, Spenny? inquired Lady Julia politely, eyeing the red-haired speaker coldly. It's... Spenny looked appealingly at Jimmy. It's my man, said Jimmy. Spike, he added in an undertone, to the woods, chase yourself, fade away. Sure, said the abashed Spike. That's right, it ain't up to me to come button in. Sorry, boss. Sorry, gents. Sorry, lady. Me for the tall grass. There's a luggage cart of sorts, said Lord Drever, pointing. Sure, said Spike affably. He trotted away. Jump in, Pitt, said Lord Drever. I'm going to walk. No, I'll walk, said Jimmy. I'd rather. I want a bit of exercise. 
Which way do I go? Frightfully good of you, old chap, said Lord Drever. Sure you don't mind? I do bar walking. Right, oh, you keep straight on. He sat down in the tonneau by his aunt's side. The last Jimmy saw was a hasty vision of him engaged in earnest conversation with Lady Julia. He did not seem to be enjoying himself. Nobody is at his best in conversation with a lady whom he knows to be possessed of a firm belief in the weakness of his intellect. A prolonged conversation with Lady Julia always made Lord Drever feel as if he were being tied into knots. Jimmy watched them out of sight and started to follow at a leisurely pace. It certainly was an ideal afternoon for a country walk. The sun was just hesitating whether to treat the time as afternoon or evening. Eventually, it decided that it was evening and moderated its beams. After London, the country was deliciously fresh and cool. Jimmy felt an unwanted content. It seemed to him just then that the only thing worth doing in the world was to settle down somewhere with three acres and a cow and become pastoral. There was a marked lack of traffic on the road. Once he met a cart, and once a flock of sheep with a friendly dog. Sometimes a rabbit would dash out into the road, stop to listen, and dart into the opposite hedge, all hind legs and white scut. But except for these, he was alone in the world. And gradually, there began to be borne in upon him the conviction that he had lost his way. It is difficult to judge distance when one is walking, but it certainly seemed to Jimmy that he must have covered five miles by this time. He must have mistaken the way. He had doubtless come straight. He could not have come straighter. On the other hand, it would be quite in keeping with the cheap substitute which served the Earl of Drever in place of a mind that he should have forgotten to mention some important turning. Jimmy sat down by the roadside. As he sat, there came to him from down the road the sound of a horse's feet, trotting. He got up. Here was somebody at last who would direct him. The sound came nearer. The horse turned the corner, and Jimmy saw with surprise that it bore no rider. Hello, he said. An accident? And by Jove, a side saddle. The curious part of it was that the horse appeared in no way a wild horse. It gave the impression of being out for a little trot on its own account, a sort of equine constitutional. Jimmy stopped the horse and led it back the way it had come. As he turned the bend in the road, he saw a girl in a riding habit running toward him. She stopped running when she caught sight of him and slowed down to a walk. Thank you ever so much, she said, taking the reins from him. Dandy, you naughty old thing. I got off to pick up my crop and he ran away. Jimmy looked at her flushed, smiling face and stood staring. It was Molly McEckern. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Intrusion of Jimmy, Part 2 of 7, by P.G. Woodhouse. If you've enjoyed this episode, please become a supporter so we can crack open the vault and bring you more vintage episodes to enhance your Classic Tales experience. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a supporter today. And thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time, and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>